Our scripture reading this morning will be taken from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 6. So get out your Bibles, Matthew chapter 6, beginning in verse 5. I'll be reading from the New American Standard Bible this morning. But you, whenever you pray, go into your inner room. And whenever you have shut the door, pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees you in secret will repay you. And when you are praying, do not use meaningless repetition as the Gentiles do, for they suppose that they will be heard for their many words. Therefore, do not be like them. For your Father knows what you need before you ask him. Pray then in this way, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. For if you forgive men for their transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men, then your Father will not forgive your transgressions. Have you ever wondered why God loves you? You say, no, but I've wondered why he loves you, Jed. <laughs> you ever step back and thought, I am not worthy of an ounce of his grace, and yet he showers me with mercy and with forgiveness? Have you thought to whom that same grace and mercy extends? Can I be so bad? Can someone be so terrible? that God's grace does not reach them? Is there a limit to God's grace? I have for our first slide up here, only the forgiving will be forgiven. Now you might see that and at first think, that's not quite right, is it? Only the forgiven will be saved, but I, I promise this is intentional. Only the forgiving will be forgiven. And what we want to do this morning is to challenge ourselves in light of God's mercy that he has upon us. I mean, we have all come to the conclusion that God loves us, or at least I hope that you have come to that conclusion, and that there is room for his mercy and for his love within our life, for that grace to be extended. What we struggle with sometimes is that same grace being extended to others. To whom does it all extend? It goes to the very heart, though, of who God is and who we ought to be as well. I'm going to read an article to you this morning. It's not a recent article. It's from about 20, 21 years ago. But it very possibly could turn your stomach because the article is about a man named Terry Clark, and he did some things within his life that are atrocious, and it's difficult to forgive such things. On Tuesday, November the 6th, 2001, at 7.10 a.m. at the penitentiary of New Mexico, just outside Santa Fe, Terry Clark was put to death by lethal injection. This was the first execution in New Mexico in nearly 42 years. Terry Clark, who was 45, was convicted of the 1986 kidnap, rape, and murder of a nine-year-old girl named Dina Lynn Gore of Artesia, New Mexico. It was one of the most brutal crimes in the state history and many in New Mexico breathed a sigh of relief whenever the sentence of death was finally carried out. Deserving? You say, oh man, let me be the one that flips the switch. Let me be the one that pushes the plunger. But there's more to this story than you might realize. Terry Clark died a Christian, and standing by his side 
In the death chamber was Al Maxey, the man that had baptized him on death row. Al currently is the pulpit minister and one of the elders for Cuba Avenue Church of Christ in Alamogordo, New Mexico. And I welcome you to look him up. If you look up Cuba Avenue Church of Christ like I did, he is still listed there as on their website as being at least a minister there. Maybe he's an elder. I don't have any more information than that. But how these dramatic turn of events in Terry's life come about is truly a tale of deliverance which God's people need to hear and to give thanks. Shortly after Terry's conviction for murder and the sentence to death, he was moved to the penitentiary of New Mexico and awaited execution. Terry's uncle was a preacher of the Lord's Church in Texas, called Al Maxey in Santa Fe and asked him to visit Terry. His nephew had never obeyed the gospel and Al was asked if he would seek to study God's word with Terry and Al Maxey willingly complied. And over the course of the next several months, Terry came to the point where he requested to be immersed into Christ. It took some time for the officials to approve for such a baptism, but on that day when it finally came in the spring of 1987, Terry was led in chains to a back room on death row by prison guards, and with the help of the prison chaplain, Al filled a large plastic laundry cart with water using a garden hose attached to an outside faucet. Terry was then unshackled, and he climbed into the laundry cart. I think that that was fitting. And Al Maxley immersed him into Christ for the forgiveness of sins. Now that was back in 1987, and so if you're doing your math, it wasn't for another 14 years until Terry Clark was executed. And within those 14 years, this article goes on to speak about how Terry struggled with his faith and how God could love him and how God could forgive him, but God was faithful, and so was Al Maxey. And though it appears that Al moved away to where he is in 2001 in Alamogordo, New Mexico, Al still continued to converse with Terry, with emails or with phone even going and visiting Terry Clark whenever he was in jail. But in the very end, Terry was trying to convert anyone that he came in contact with. His cellmates, the prison guards that would come by his way. Whenever he was allowed a spiritual advisor, he asked for Brother Maxie. And once within that final week of Terry's life, Al was able to spend in the cell with Terry countless hours studying God's word and praying. Terry confessing those sins that he had committed within his life and all along not feeling worthy of the forgiveness that he had received. Can you relate to that? Are there people that are just so terrible that God does not forgive them? Let me just say as an aside, Jeff Dahmer was converted in prison. That man who did horrendous things to other human beings at the end of his life was reached by the gospel message and he suffered a brutal death there in jail. But Jeff Dahmer was a Christian, as far as we know, that he died in Christ. Now, if you don't know who Jeff Dahmer is, that's, that's probably good. But here, what we have before us is, once again, that God's love is extended to even the unlovable. Only the forgiving will be forgiven. And you say, I don't like that. Okay. Well, Jesus said what? In Matthew chapter 6 and verse 14, he says, for if you forgive others for their transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, then your Father will not forgive your transgressions. Why is that a stipulation right there at the very beginning of Jesus' ministry in the Sermon on the Mount? Because it goes to the very heart of who God is. And if we are going to be like him, then we need to emulate those things of our heavenly Father. What if God said, okay, there are some things that are just so terrible, you don't have to worry about forgiving those folks. Now, that doesn't mean that we are condoning evil, that we accept those evil practices that we had just read about, but what it means is when one 
turns to the Lord and repents and asks for forgiveness, I am under obligation to have an attitude that is like God's. Else, I am what? I am ungodly. That's basically what Jesus is saying here within his lesson. I... We all love the Sermon on the Mount. I pray that you do as well. Here Jesus has a multitude of people that has been following him in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. They are there upon the shores of the Sea of Galilee. Probably the hill is sloping down towards it there upon the northwestern end near Capernaum. And the people are sitting down within the grass and upon the stones, the common folk to hear Jesus. Why Why come to Jesus? Well, it says at the end of of chapter 7, Because the things that Jesus said amazed them. Because he was speaking in a way that the teachers were not teaching. Because God was able to, through his son, say, these are what my intentions were. Whenever I said in Leviticus chapter 19 and verse 18 that you should not take vengeance nor hold a grudge against your brother, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself, Jesus was saying those same things. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are those whenever you are persecuted, when people say all kinds of things about you. Do not repay evil for evil. Respect what is right in the sight of all men. Christ was showing them this, is, this was God's intent. Do you have grievances? Are you at odds with others? Do you feel like you are being imposed upon? Perhaps you are even experiencing hatred. But Jesus was saying something to you and I. And what he was saying is my disciples respond differently than people within the world. Outlook determines outcome. My attitude is paramount in my relationship with God and with you. Well, how does one have such an attitude? Well, remember what Paul's attitude was throughout his life. He says to his son in the faith, Timothy, it is a trustworthy statement deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, among whom I am the foremost of all. Paul says, I am the chief of sinners. Now you think of that coming from an apostle's mouth to his son in the faith. These should be words of encouragement, shouldn't they? Yet there, in 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 15, Paul says, if you're looking for somebody that ought to stand condemned, look no further. It's me because I have done things that is worse than anyone else has done. Really? Paul? You don't mean that, do you? Well, yes, he does. As Saul of Tarsus, he sure does. What was he as Saul of Tarsus? What did he do? He persecuted the church. He imprisoned those and dragged them to Jerusalem, consenting to their death trying to get them to recant from their faith in Christ. This man also said in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, For I am the least of the apostles and not fit to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. What did Paul understand all throughout his life that we sometimes forget? Do you ever start to get this sense of, "Ah, I'm not that bad? I haven't done all that much wrong. You know, God doesn't really have to forgive all that much with me. Do we ever get that sense? Do you know what that's called besides wrong? Self-righteous. It's called self-righteous. If I really understood what I look like with my sin and God's sight, I would cower every time I came into his presence. I would crawl and bow every single time. And you say, well, but I haven't done. No, okay. But yes, you have. Because sin is an anathema to God. Like we spoke about last week, all unrighteousness is sin. All lawlessness is sin. And the the perpetrator of that sin places themselves then in a state of condemnation. If it wasn't for the mercy and the forgiveness of God, none of us would be saved. And so what God tells us is, remember what you have received. Peter says, well, how many times do I have to forgive my brother? Lord, seven times? In Matthew chapter 18, Jesus says, no, 70 times seven. And then he tells the parable of the king who was going to settle his accounts. And there was a servant that owed him 10,000 talents. 
10,000 talents, that's like 60 million denarii. A denarii is a day's wage. Add up whatever you make within a day, multiply it times 60 million. That's how much this guy owed the king. Uh, needless to say, he was never going to repay that amount. 10,000 talents, 60 million days wage. And he begged and he pleaded. He said, don't throw me in jail, please. And the king had mercy upon him. And he says, your debt is forgiven. That servant, that same servant goes out and he finds another fellow servant of his that owed him a hundred denarii. A few months wages. And he demands that that man pay him back. And whenever he can't, he begins to choke him, it says. Pay me that money. And he says, I can't. And he throws him into prison. King catches wind of all of this. And what does he say? You know how this ends, don't you? Then, the, then summoning him, his Lord said to him, you wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have had mercy on your fellow slave in the same way that I had mercy on you? And his Lord moved with anger, handed him over to the torturers until he should repay all that was owed him. My heavenly father will also do the same to you if each of you does not forgive his brother from your heart. Is that not what we have illustrated for us in our premise today? What is it that God expects of me in my relationship with you and my attitude with you? What is it that God expects of you in return to me? A heart that is full of mercy and of compassion and to be forgiving of one another. And so we are counseled all throughout the scriptures to this end. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 13, Paul says, Bearing with one another and forgiving each other, whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 2, With all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love. Verse 32 of that same chapter 4, Be kind to one another, compassionate, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also forgave you. And then in James chapter 2 and verse 12, For judgment will be merciless to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Only if I am forgiving will I be forgiven. I know that that is difficult. I know, but it is what God calls us to be. And if I need to have a check on my attitude, then all I need to do is to look at what I view like in God's sight with my sin outside of his son. And it is completely undeserving. But by the grace of God, I will do my best, but I still am going to fall, and that failure would bring me into condemnation if it wasn't for God's mercy. We have such an awesome God. We have such a wonderful, merciful Savior, so that even ones like Terry Clark at the end of his life, with the sin that was within his life, could hear the gospel message and desire, can I be a part of that? I, I want to have those same blessings. What would it have been like? For that preacher, Al, as he receives that call, what must that have been like for him to hear there's a man that has committed these acts and I want you to go and study with him? Why didn't he, as soon as he realized what Terry had done, why didn't he say, find somebody else? I, I abhor the things that this man has done. I will never find it within my heart to show mercy to such a man. But did you hear who was within the background of Terry Clark? It said he had an uncle who was a preacher within the church. Terry had never uh, believed or been baptized into the Lord. He had never come into the church. But Terry had Al Maxey there because of his uncle who had called him. If you want uh, a copy of this article, by the way, I have it. It was within a Christian magazine back in 2001, December of 2001. But it took Al Maxey stepping out in faith and saying, I am going to do what I have been called to do. Now, was it just Al's? Because he's a minister? Because he is educated? Because he's a, a counselor? Because he is one that can 
you know, see those stark realities in life. Is that what Jesus said? Did Jesus say, you go and find somebody to send to them that will be able to stomach their sin? That's not what he said to those people as they were sitting upon the grass there. He says, you become like God. That spirit of mercy residing within your heart. And that means I don't draw lines where God doesn't draw lines. Only the forgiving will be forgiven. Now let's talk about the flip side of that. And that means for us there is hope, isn't there? If Paul can say, I am the chief of sinners, that I was a murderer, that I stood so far outside of God's grace and of God's mercy, I should have been cast aside is what is implied there, but he didn't. And what did Saul of Tarsus become? He became the apostle to the Gentiles. That was his title. Paul says, I am going to go to those ones that I at one time saw as rejects. I am the apostle to those ones that I at one time saw as being unworthy. And in the process, he emulates Christ and he is receiving the forgiveness of his sins. You ever heard this phrase, once forgiven, act forgiven? What does that mean? Once forgiven, act forgiven. Certainly like the woman who was caught in adultery where Jesus says, go and sin no more. But also, once forgiven, act forgiven. Only the forgiving will be forgiven. To be forgiven means that I have done that which I should not do. To stand in need of God's forgiveness means I recognize my own unworthiness to his love. To me, that means once I realize who I am in light of God, outside of his mercy, condemned, Lost, but because now I am forgiven, I am washed and I am new. I think that that should affect every single aspect of my life and my relationship with others. I understand once forgiven, I act forgiven. I know that that's not an easy lesson for us. Do you hold grudges? Are you easily offended? Whenever your toes get stomped on by the word of God, do you take offense of sinners I am the chief. I think that that should be each one of our personal assessments of every single one of us in light of God's love whenever we understand his mercy. Outlook determines outcome. And whenever I truly see things the way that God sees them, then the ones like Terry Clark of the world do not get, in, get written off. The ones like Jeff Dahmer in his dying days. If, if they had a chance, ones like even Stalin or Hitler or Pilate or the Caesars, nobody gets written off so long as there is breath within their nostrils, within God's view. He desires all men to be saved, right? Peter says it's not his desire that any man should perish, but all should come to repentance. All should come to repentance. And so let me take you to Golgotha in closing. There's three crosses upon that hill. Christ is on one of them. I want you to place yourself in the position of one of the other two because you're not Christ, you're not our Savior. And one thief on the cross says to Jesus, if you are the Messiah, why don't you save us and yourself as well? Is that you? Do you see the forgiveness? And then you taunt Christ? for it or are you like that other thief on the other side who rebuked him and said this man has done nothing wrong we've done things that are deserving of this this man hasn't done anything to deserve this and he turns to Jesus and in his final breath knowing that he is God himself he says remember me when you come into your kingdom and Jesus says today you will be with me in paradise only the forgiving will be forgiven. Won't you come as we stand and as we sing?